Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by OpEdNews.com. OpEd News is a progressive news and opinion site, and the Bottom Up Show is based on the idea that we're transitioning from a predominantly top-down culture to a more bottom-up one uh, that's been catalyzed by the internet and smartphones. I try to have people on who can talk about different takes on on that, on bottom up, on top down, and about activism and progressive issues as well. Uh, I'm happy to have Henry Giroux as my return guest on the show. Henry holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public Interest in the English and Cultural Studies Department, and he's the Paulo Freire Distinguished Scholar in Critical Pedagogy. His most recent books are The Public in Peril, Trump, and the Menace of American Authoritarianism and America at War with Itself. And his website is Henry A. Giro, G I R O U X dot com. Welcome back. Well, thanks, Rob. Good to be on. Yeah. So, you got this new book out Public in Peril Trump and the Menace of American Authoritarianism. What's your goal here? Well, I, I think like anything else, I think that if you are really concerned about questions of democracy and concerned about questions of resistance, I think you have to begin with what Václav Havel once said. He said, "Culture follows polit politics follows culture. And I think that what that means is that you have to do something that is very dangerous in, in, in oppressive societies. You have to make power visible. And I think that um, one of the things that I've tried in this book is to understand both the history and the current workings of an administration that represents an enormous threat to democracy and to try to break it down into a number of ways to make that very specific, whether we're talking about the threat to higher education, the threat to critical thinking, the threat to public education, the threat to, uh, to young people, the war on youth, the war on the environment. What I've done in this book, I, what I always do and what I try to do in all of my work is I try to connect the dots. I try to bring together issues that often don't seem connected or are basically addressed as singular, singular issues rather than looking at them in some kind of complexity. So you start off talking about authoritarianism, and it's in the subtitle of the book, and you talk specifically about Trump's brand of authoritarianism. What's Trump's brand of authoritarianism? How does that relate to authoritarianism in general? Well, I, I think it, it, it echoes uh, a number of elements that we've seen in other for, uh, in, in his in, in past forms of authoritarianism I mean I think this this resurgent nationalism the logic of disposability the upfront racism the white the white uh, supremacy uh, the attack on the on, on the on the welfare state the attack on labor unions the attack on the environment the attempt to reinforce the power of the upper one tenth percent um, I mean, to me, these are all the attempt to control the media, the attempt to, attempt to live in a world in which you, you have an us-them relationship, uh, the attempt to demonize people and to say, make the claim that they're responsible for the country's problems. I mean, these are all, these resonate and have an echo with the, the kind of, a number of fascist elements in the past that, that basically are quite both instructive and scary represent both a tragedy for democracy, I think, and a resurgence of totalitarian forms and basically being wrapped in the rhetoric of the American flag. I mean, there's, a, there's been a long debate about, you know, whether, in, in which many people seem to think that totalitarianism or authoritarianism in general is kind of an historical relic. You know, it somehow gets frozen in time. And we say, well, it's not about genocide, uh, but there, the, the, these, these elements of totalitarianism take different forms in different periods. They reemerge, and I think that what the book attempts to do is to point very specifically, as a number of people have been doing recently, Timothy Snyder, the historian, I mean, a number of people, Robert Paxton, a number of people have talked about how there are a whole range of things that Trump does, the, you know, that, that really echoes uh, a, a kind of fascist legacy of the past. Okay, so you say that America is at war with its ideals. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think it's a country that is in the hands of extremists. I think these extremists hate democracy. I think they see it as a threat. I think this is a, a, a more visible extension of what we saw with the Powell memo in the 1970s, 
the Trilateral Commission that talked about democracy as an excess. I mean, in the past, you know, you had something happened in the 60s that scared the death out of conservatives and reactionaries. And all of a sudden, you had the democratization of a number of institutions, including higher education. You had the rise of all kinds of civil rights movements, everything from the literal civil rights movement to the gay movement, to the, and of course, the, war, the anti-war movement. And I think that there was a, a pushback, a blowback, that proceeded from that movement that uh, finds its end point in Trump, a, a kind of Frankenstein uh, emboldenment of that. You know, whether it's the rise of the police state, the death of the social state, whether it's the war on, on black youth, whether it's the defunding of public goods, including public schools, whether it's the elimination of social provisions, the attack on labor unions. What we see with Trump that's different is that the masquerade is gone. There are no codes. You know, I mean, there's, there's no attempt to hide this stuff. I mean, you know, you, you get uh, Kelly the other day coming out and basically providing an apology for the Civil War. I mean, I mean, this, you, you can't make this up. Uh, and, I, and so I think that what you, you get with Trump is, is you know, all the, all the taboos are visible. And not only are they visible, they're a mark of pride. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's OK to be a resurgent white nationalist. You know, it's OK to say that black culture is the culture of criminality. It's OK to say that law and order is basically the glue that will hold society together. It's OK to say that all Muslims are potential terrorists. I mean, there's no there's no attempt to hide this stuff. I mean, the Republicans in the past, whether we're talking about Bush or others, I mean, there was some attempt to lie and, and, and to sort of cover over what we see now, not with Trump. Trump is just an outright, I mean, an outright authoritarian. He has no apologies whatsoever. He's incapable of apologizing, actually. He's such a narcissist, a serial liar, and serial groper. Where do we end here? That, uh, you know, he, he lives in a world that is actually uh, barricaded by his own narrow sense of the world, which is impetuous, which is uh, uh, unthoughtful, which is ignorant. When he says he loves the uneducated, he's right, because he's talking about himself course yeah yeah so you talk about the task of challenging the new authoritarianism how how do we do that you do it a whole range of ways and i think the first thing you do is you begin to take questions of education seriously i mean i don't think anything will happen unless people wake up and realize that they're being screwed that that in the name of basically being saved by the heroic leader that their social provisions will be taken away their medicaid would collapse uh, they'll probably be unemployed, and that what we're dealing with are a series of, of lies that bear down and that are going to bear down in their lives in a very direct way. And so when I say that education matters, what I'm trying to say is that education is central to politics itself. You know, nothing happens unless people are educated. Nothing happens unless you make how power works visible, and you do it in a whole range of spheres. I mean, we're not just talking about schools. We're talking about alternative radio, like what you have. We're talking about the kind of publishing that you do. We're talking about opening up these spheres in a way that provide an alternative set of spheres in which people can have access to information that breaks through the fog of just utter ignorance that now operates in, in is characteristic of mainstream media, uh, media. I mean, mainstream media is not the New York Times, and it's not the Washington Post. It's Fox News. And it's the 95% of those radio stations that are basically owned by conservatives. I mean, so it's... Hmm? By Sinclair. Yeah, by Sin right, by Sinclair. And, and, and so it, it seems to me that, you know, that's the first issue. The second issue is we've got to get away. The left is fragmented. It's just too fragmented. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really, while these individual singular issues matter, the environment matters, gay rights matters, the question of uh, organizing against police violence matters, but they've got to be brought together. They've got to become part of a broader social movement that is capable of thinking outside of the established parties. We need to convince people that capitalism is not democracy, that they're not the same thing. And that if we can do that, that makes clear that we do not have a political party that represents that position. We've got to resurrect the language of democratic socialism. Thirdly, it seems to me that artists, intellectuals, public intellectuals need to learn something. And that is, they need to learn how to write and speak in a way that is rigorous and accessible. They need to frame narratives that touch people's lives 
and not speak in abstractions that people just don't know anything about. I mean, my father, working class guy, uh, passed away now, but he once told me a story I never forgot. He was in the factory working in a mixing chemicals. And he said, these guys came to see me, SBS, you know, SDS, right? And he said, they were talking about Mao Zedong and how, you know, he put the alphabet on the back of workers who were going through the mountains. And he said, why aren't they talking to me about the fact that we don't have adequate working conditions here, that the safety conditions are horrendous? And that's the point, right? I mean, how do you talk about people in a way that addresses their lives in terms of the actual context of their lives? And how do you then get them to realize that context has broader implications so that when we're talking about the, the destruction of the welfare state, when they're losing health care, and we say, hey, look, this is not just about you're losing health care. It's about basically taking, reducing the taxes of the rich. It's about money being redistributed upward. It's about more than, it's about losing your schools because rich people basically are going to do everything they can because they now are global elite. They care nothing about nation states and the social contract. They're going to do everything they can to screw you. And here's all the ways they're going to do it. You need to connect the dots. And if you can't connect the dots with people, they can't see the bigger picture. And, and along those lines, you say we need to emphasize the connections between diverse social formations. Right. And I you just said, I, I think of that as coalition building. Right. Can you talk a bit more about how you see that happening? Well, I, I think that how I see it happening is that at the local level, I mean, all movements tend to start at the local level. And it seems to me that once we get people involved in local issues, then it seems to me the, the issue then is to connect those issues to broader issues and to allow various groups to begin to come together to talk about these people, to talk about these issues in a way that can begin to build a political social formation, one that does not just operate at the local level, but begins there. I, I don't see how it's going to happen unless that's the first initiative. The second initiative is that on a federal, on a national level, these movements have got to begin to get in dialogue with each other. I mean, you can't talk about police violence without talking about neoliberalism. I'm sorry, you know. I mean, you you you, you can't talk about you can't talk about the defunding and the collapse of public education. This isn't just about Betsy DeVos. I mean, this is about inequality. We've got to talk about massive inequality. And it seems to me that these organizations have got to move and join with labor unions, um, involve them in the dialogue so that they can basically begin to develop a coalition that you know works together and touches and, and works at both the, the local, the federal, the, the state, the federal level, and, and begins to have international con contacts abroad. So, okay, you said you can't talk about police violence without talking about neoliberalism. Yeah. Explain that. Well, I'll tell you how it works. It's very simple, actually. As the welfare state gets defunded and social provisions begin to die out, behaviors that basically reflect social, uh, social problems be begin to become criminalized. So instead of when you have kids in school who have trouble, in, whether they're falling asleep or, or whether they're hungry and they're, they, you know, they're just not getting enough food and they're acting out, they, they don't go, they're not sent to a principal's office. Now they're arrested and they put a police car. When you have kids, when you have homeless people who basically are on the street asking for some kind of relief, we, we turn that into a criminal act. In, in Ferguson, we saw a whole range of behaviors that were criminalized in order to actually support the budget of the police station. So as you have an increasing number of behaviors being criminalized, the social state collapses and the punishing state rises. Just as where, where, does liberal, where does neoliberalism fit into that? Well, neoliberalism, I, I think about what it means. I mean, it's a project that says you concentrate more and more wealth in the hands of relatively few people and that the only, com the only relationships that matter are commercial relationships. It says that self-interest is the ultimate ideal of American self-interest, the, the ultimate ideal of, of American society. It says that uh, uh, the market now defines uh, not just the economy, but all of social life. Everything is commercialized. It says that public goods have to be sold off into private hands. I mean, what you're talking about is a political, economic, and social project that not only supports the harshest forms of competition, not only supports the survival of the fittest ethos, 
not only individualizes every problem that people have, tells them it's their responsibility, it prevents people from translating private issues into larger public issues. And in the end, what you have is a massive shift of finances and power to relatively few people at the expense basically of the rest of society. So all these institutions that are supported by virtue of the welfare state that are public goods now are increasingly privatized. And in the midst of that, you have the emergence and the growth of a paramilitary state because that's the only function it has left. The only function it has left is basically not to address social problems, but to believe that violence is the only way you can address anything. And that's what neoliberalism does. It's a very violent, it seems to me, assault, not just on the minds of individuals, not just on the question of justice, but on the bodies of individuals. Now, I think it's important that we identify who are the neoliberals and where we find them. I think it's a, it's a bipartisan kind of a thing. You see it in both Democrats and Republicans. And it, it, who embraces their neoliberalist self? Well, I, I, yeah. I know that, that uh, it came out of the, a lot of it came out of the University of Chicago with uh, Milton Friedman. Uh, but are there people now who are actually saying, hey, I'm a neoliberal and proud of it? I, I mean, I think there are people who, I, I don't think they use that term because the term has become a moniker for critique, a form of social and political critique. I mean, we know the history. You know, the history is, 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 is well known. I mean, it begins with Chicago, when it, it, uh, of course, with Milton Friedman, who seemed to believe that the only purpose of government was basically to protect the interests of the rich and the markets. And then it shifts to, to, Chile, to Chile under Pinochet. And Pinochet actually be, Chile becomes a model state for, for what neoliberalism can do. And we know what that meant. That meant people just disappeared who disagreed with it. And I think that what, what has happened now, particularly since the 1970s, is that the, the, the people who are the, what we might call the neoliberal elite represent a shift in what, what used to be from a manufacturing economy to a financial economy. Financialization is now how it runs the country, as you well know. And these are people who run the hedge funds. These are people who basically run the banks. I mean, these are people who make enormous amounts of money trading money. And I think that they're not just part of one party, as, you, as you're suggesting, Rob. I mean, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton basically was as much a part of Goldman Sachs and Wall Street as many of the Republicans are. The difference between the Republicans and the Democrats is the Democrats try to hide that relationship where the Republicans embrace it. And so I'm, I'm asking, how do you identify who are the politicians who are the neoliberals who believe in it, who protect it? Who Look at their policies. Look at the policies they support. That's all. I mean, when, they, when, 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 when Obama all of a sudden wants to bail out the banks but not bail out homeowners, I think it would be fair to say that he's on the side of neoliberalism. I think when you look at people who pass all kinds of regulations in Congress uh, that, that, that are uh, dismantling the welfare state while providing enormous tax breaks to the banks and to the, you know, to the rich, I think they're pretty much neoliberals. When you look at people who are assaulting the environment in the interest of basically allowing power to be uh, to, to, to amalgamate in, in the hands of a financial elite, that's neoliberalism. When you deregulate business and you promote policies that deregulate business, which, is a, which promotes a, a kind of lawlessness, that's neoliberalism. When you have people who are essentially trying to privatize everything and promoting policies to that degree, you have neoliberals. They're the hard neoliberals. You know, they're pretty easy to identify. The soft neoliberals are different. They speak in the language of celebrity culture. They're, they're the, what I call the, th the therapeutic liberals. You know, they, they operate off the assumption that, that all you need is self-reliance. You know, all you need is to try hard. You know, they, they're Oprah Winfrey, you know, blown large, right? They're the people who write self-help help books. They're, they're, they're the people who say, hey, look, you really want to make it in the United States? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Own your own emotions. Learn how to be tough. You know, I mean, you know. I mean, this is, this is like, how do you say it? This is like putty that turns into water. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't address systemic problems. It blames individuals for problems they didn't produce. It, it makes the claim, as David Brooks does in the New York Times endlessly, that poverty is really about moral character. Uh, you know, I mean, this is the stuff of, of uh, musicians. 
So Bill Clinton, certainly. Oh, Bill Clinton's a hor- Bill Clinton was a horrible president in terms of what he did. I mean, Bill Clinton dismantled the welfare state and he produced the incarceration state, the incarceration state. I mean, Bill Clinton was on the side of, of Bill, Bill Clinton was a neoliberal to the ninth degree, but he was deceptive. I mean, you know, when you, when I often hear the phrase, he was the first black president, I think, wow. If, I mean, if that nothing is more, if that isn't an example of magical realism, when you think about what he did to black communities in terms of the, you know, three strikes, you know, in terms of about, you know what he did to the welfare system, or what he did in terms of passing laws that uh, produced mass incarceration among racial minorities, it's outrageous. But they bought it, and and so something he did succeeded in terms of his story, his narrative, the message. Somehow, the educational process, the communication process, just failed. No, uh, no, it, it didn't. Fail. ID now. I'm going to do a station ID now. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. Sponsored by opednews.com. That's where you're going to get progressive, left of liberal, no liberal, left of liberal news and opinion uh, with, with great writers like Henry. And my guest today is Henry Giroux. He's got a new book out, The Public in Peril, Trump and the Menace of American Authoritarianism. You can listen to the show on Pacifica Radio, Progressive Radio Network, at opednews.com slash podcast, and uh, on the Op-Ed News YouTube channel. So we've, we've been talking about neoliberals, and you, you, you know, a little bit ago you talked about how we need to connect the different groups, but you also say in the book that there's a problem with disconnection, and we have to refuse disconnection. What do you mean by that? I, I, think, I, I'm, I think what I've tried to say is a couple of things. I, I think that Theoretically and politically, it's important to basically connect the dots between, as I said earlier, between a number of issues that are often treated in a very singular kind of narrow fashion. Um, you, you, we need to theorize the totality. Of, we need a more comprehensive sense of politics and how that works and how it comes together and how it reproduces a particular regime of oppression that is distinct, I think, right now to the United States. Secondly, it, it, it seems to me that we need to, we don't, you live in a world in which the culture of immediacy depoliticizes people. People live in sensations. They live, live in the overflow of information. They live in a 24-7 time frame. And this is, this, this, is, this is very discouraging because what the first casualty is historical memory. The first casualty is the second is historical memory and public memory. You memory, talk about a culture of forgetting and lies, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that you know, when we can't look to the past to try to understand the problems that we sometimes confront, you know, it seems to me we're, we're in, a, in a much more vulnerable position to accept that, those, those issues as if they're okay. You know, they become normalized because there's no way to weigh them against the massive destruction, misery, suffering, and violence that they perpetuated in the past. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's... <laughs> I mean, when you look at the language that people like Trump and, you know, and his and, uh, Breitbart News, you know, I mean, that these people use, and you can't situate that in a way to understand what the end point of that language was. The end point was genocide. The end point was racial purity. The end point was eugenicism. The end point was killing people who had disabilities. The end point was putting intellectuals in prisons and concentration camps. I mean... You know, so that when we, when, we, when we see images of what happened, for instance, in, in Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, Jesus, I mean, people with Heil Hitler signs running around, and the press, and the, and the president says, well, you have good people on both sides, and all of a sudden, we don't get an immediate historical analysis. Of, I mean, good people don't join parades that, that basically say Heil Hitler or Jews go home, you know, go back to Israel, sorry. Uh, there's, there's an educational void there. There's a, there's a kind of what I call a massive uh, tsunami of civic illiteracy that grips the country and it paralyzes it because it makes people stupid and ignorant and, 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 and vulnerable to the worst kinds of ideologies. Wow, massive tsunami of civic illiteracy. I, gotta, I had to write that one down. So, 
Now you're the uh, you, one, part of your job. Your one of your titles is uh, Paulo Freire, distinguished scholar in critical pedagogy, and Freire talks about how the oppressed have to learn how to think. They they have to, so. I think that of the 33% who still support Trump, a lot of them, they're, 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 their heads are just so beaten down that they're part of the oppressed system, and that's why they embrace him. Because a lot of the oppressed are afraid to leave their oppression, right? Well, I, I think a lot of them feel powerless in a way that, uh, in which there are not a lot of alternatives to basically address that powerlessness. And I, and I, and I, and I think that you couple that with, with, a, with, with a, a media ecology that constantly tells them that the biggest problem is they face are illegal immigrants and, and blacks. And it's very easy for them to fall into that kind of ideological paralysis. I mean, my, my concern is, I, I think one of the things I've seen on the left that I really dislike, you know, is I've, I've seen this attempt to shame people who follow Trump. Do you know what I mean? That, I mean, shaming doesn't go anywhere. I mean, calling people racist, you know, they're just racist and stupid. I mean, the real issue is, what are the pedagogical challenges we have to face with these people? You know, given the fact that they've internalized ideologies that are self-destructive. You know, how, how do we enter into that conversation? Okay, I mean, so wait, when you say, what are the pedagogical challenges? That's a, a word that a lot of people may not digest so easily. You basically are saying, what do we need to do to, to wake these people up and teach them? Right, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, what... What, what, what are the educational challenges at work here, right? I mean, how do you enter into their language, their arguments in ways to be able to unsettle those arguments so that at least they might be open to different interpretations? Look, I'm not, I'm not a romanticist or utopian. I realize that some people are gone. You know, I realize that. You know, that the, the, the racism is so internalized. The hatred is, is it's, it's very difficult. But I don't have any idea. I mean, uh, say there's 33 percent that support Trump. Right. What percent of them do you think are the really gone, never retrievable, never education, educatable? And how? What percent of them do you think? I'd say two percent. Two percent. So most of them yeah, are the can, can wake up. Yeah, yeah. They're the. I mean, the two percent are the, the real fringe elements here. You know, I mean, they're they're people who who, who basically are carrying around the the Heil Hitler signs. You know, who, who have found an identity in a community of hatred. And it's very hard, I think, to touch those people. I, I don't even, not even worth it for me. But I think there are others who are in small communities who are confused. I mean, I, they've lost their jobs. I mean, I, 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 they, they, they've drank the, the, the Kool-Aid, you know, around racism, right? They ha they've made the wrong connections. Those people, I mean, you know, you, know, you can't just write them off. I mean, it doesn't work to write them off. That's for sure. You write them off, and what you're going to get is you're going to get an apocalyptic populism that's, that really is going to be threatening to the country in a way that we've never seen before. Because it'll, it, it'll, it'll provoke a civil war, you know, of sorts. I mean, you, you Apocalyptic have, populism. That's yeah. a, another interesting term. What are, you, what are you talking about there? I'm talking about a populism that's on the side of violence and, and death, and social and political death. I mean, a populism that has no regards for democracy, hates it, and believes that the only way for, for the society to function is to go right back to the 1940s and 30s when women knew their place, blacks knew their place, uh, and white people reigned just like they do in Disneyland. It's a, Disney, it's a Disneyland, it's a Disney notion of, of a 1950s Disney notion of Main Street. I think in a lot of ways you're talking about evangelicals. Not just even, look, fundamentalism comes in many forms, right? And religious fundamentalism in the form of evangelicals is just one of them. That's all. I mean, there's a market fundamentalism, there's an intellectual fundamentalism, ideological fundamentalisms. They come in many forms. And I, and, I, and I think that what holds them all together are people who live in what I call circles of certainty. No doubt. Circles of certainty? Circles of certainty. There's no gray areas. There's no giving. They live in a world so complete that I, we could argue that it's the most intense form of political purity. It's a form of political purity. You know, they're right, everybody else is wrong, and anybody who disagrees with them should be eliminated. You know, wiped off the earth. That's what fundamentalism. The population do you think are those people? What, Rob? What percentage of the population make up those people with the circles of 
of certainty? I don't know what the percentage is. I mean, I, I think it's pretty sure. I think if we're talking about evangelicals and we're talking about the religious right, I think it's still me about 25%. 25, that's a lot. That's a, and they're people. They're, they're, they're a powerful group of people. They're probably not going to be influenced by any conversation, any education. Well, the, the, the good news is that the other side of that is there's a religious left, <laughs> you know, that actually can talk in, in terms of, of religious categories. And, and who knows, maybe move people. I mean, I think people get moved. I mean, I, I think the good news is that the contradictions is becoming so great, so overdetermined, so blatant. The hatred is so visible. It's no longer on the fringes. It's now in the center of power that it forces people in some ways who are evangelical, who believe in God, you know, all this stuff. I mean, uh, who believe in the principles of faith. I mean, my, my sense is that some people say, wow, you know, I'm not buying that. I'm not going that far. I'm not, that's, that's like off the planet, right? I mean, that's so extreme, so far beyond the pale of what anybody who makes the claim to be religious could uphold. Um, that, you know, there, there may be room for a different kind of dialogue, a different kind of intervention. Okay. So you... Can you speak up your little... The volume's a little low. You talk about the need to merge education and politics. Right. What is that noise in the background? Uh, that's my... That's a stupid... Uh, I can't control it. It's... Uh, it's an antiquated heating system. <laughs> heating system, okay. <laughs> At least it's not a toilet flushing. It could have no, been. No, no, my, my office is like 1902. Yeah. Right. I could right. probably get into a 1902 office. All right, so this is going to be stay in the video, but it'll be out of the uh, radio show, uh, this conversation. All right, so you talk about merging education and politics. What do you have in mind there? Well, I, I think when I talk about merging education and politics, I think that education could, should be central to politics. I think if we're really going to, you, you know, look, one of the things that has to be realized and has been lost in many ways by the left is that you can't talk about domination simply in terms of economic structures. You have to talk about domination in terms of questions of beliefs, questions of persuasion, what it means to, in, in some way, to be able to speak to people in a language that in which they can recognize themselves. And I think these are the weapons of struggle. They're not just about pointing to, to power as if the only way in which it seems to succeed is by structures bearing down directly on people's lives. Culture matters. It matters. The way people identify with a sense of their own agency matters. The way in which desires get mobilized matters. And it seems to me that when, when you say that education is central to politics itself, then you have to address those issues. Yeah. Well, well you, you just said that you have to go beyond economics. So where, where do you go then? Well, you, you talk about uh, the kinds of problems that people face in their lives uh, at, at an everyday level. You talk about the quality of their schools. You know, you talk about the, the you talk about the, you talk about the, uh, the, the isolation that they often feel. You talk about the lack of social provisions. I mean, you talk about what it means in some fundamental way to imagine a world very different from the world in which they find themselves. So I want you to go into a little more detail here. I'd like you to literally give us an example of what kind of a, of a conversation you might have with somebody. Well, I mean, look, you know, if people, somebody might say, okay, uh, I lost my job. You know, I, we really need, we really need, uh, Trump is, is, is going to do something with, with uh, bringing jobs back to America, right? And let's assume that these are people in the coal mining industry. I mean, I, I would say to them, you know, look, there are a number of things going on here in your life that need to be addressed. And that is, what, what does it mean for you to be able to survive beyond just working in the coal mining industry? I mean, how, how do you imagine living a good life? What would you need? What kind of things matter? You want to talk about your family? You want to talk about good health care? You want to talk about good schools? You want to talk about what a community means? You want to talk about what it means to be able to take vacations and enjoy yourself? You want to, we want to talk about the way money operates in an economy? I mean, a whole range of things. You want to talk about uh, what happens when you, when you retire? You know, in, in your, you know how, do you th how are you thinking about retiring? What's your life going to be like? You know, what, what, what does it mean to be free in America for you? 
know, how would you imagine that? How would you imagine a society different than the one you're now in? How, how do you talk about democracy? What does that mean? You know, what, what, where, where, where do you spend your time in ways that make you happy that you would like to see amplified? What sort of resources do you need? What does it mean, for instance, for you to imagine a future for your children that would be better than the one you have? How would you think about that? What, is that, what does that mean? You know, what kind of clubs exist in the community that you can go to where you can meet other human beings? How does that work? So I, I think that it's a small change of everyday life. You know, what, what is it that keeps you and your, your partner together? What is it that alienates you? I mean, what, what is it that you want that makes you happy that you've lost? How do you get it back? How do you think about it? Do you, do you have a lot of friends? You have a lot of clubs you go to? You have, how do you socialize? You know, what do you say to people in the Midwest who are now dying every day by the truckload on opioids? How do you talk to them about something other than economic structures? You're talking about despair. You're talking about alienation. You're talking about social atomization. You're talking about people who are cut off. But how do you translate that into people waking up and realizing that they're dealing with an authoritarian president, it's an authoritarian Congress, how do you take that, those series of questions that you describe and turn that into somebody who becomes activated, who decides, I'm going to go out and I'm going to do something about this? I think the first thing you have, to, you have to convince people is they can't do it alone. You have to face these problems alone, you're done. That's exactly what they want you to do. They want you to believe that these problems are your problems and yours alone. And I think then you can begin to make connections. Which to problems? Please? Which whether, problems? Well, whether we're talking about the problem of health care, whether adequate health care, whether we're talking about the problem of decent jobs, whether we're talking about living in an environment where your children are not getting asthma. Okay, so wait, wait. So let me, let me just get this straight. You're saying that they want people to think that it's their own fault and their own problem that they don't have decent health care. It's their, it's their fault that their kids are not getting decent education. It's their fault that they, they don't have a decent job. Right. That's right. That's what I'm saying. How are they doing that? How is well, who doing it? How are they getting people to think that way? Because they argue that there's no such thing as social problems. They're only individual problems. That's why you have to learn about neoliberalism, right? I mean, a central educational tenet is that all problems are individual problems. You buy that assumption, you plug into this notion of radical individualism, and you can't even imagine thinking outside of that framework. That's what's so damaging about it. That's what's so powerful about it. And everywhere you look, it's reinforced in the culture, isn't it? Whether yeah. you're talking about the culture of celebrity, which is about the culture of lifestyles, whether you're talking about the constant message that the only relationship that matters is commercial, whether you're talking about the assumption that the only thing that really matters in a society in which we now live is getting ahead at the expense of everybody else. So all you're talking about an ideology that both blames people for their own problems and while at the same time claims that the only way those problems can be solved is in a war against everybody else. That's a dead end. And the thing is, you're talking about neoliberalism, but really economic theory today, the dominant economic theory today with academics and economics, based on this idea that jobs are not included, social issues are not included. This is the current, modern, contemporary economic model that academic economics is based upon, and that the leaders in economics literally have to embrace in order to get published, because that's where the publications are at. I mean, I mean, the, the, if, you, if you look at almost any economics department in the United States, it's about free market economies. It's right. About, it's about neoliberalism. That's what it's about. Yes. And I, and I think that the central tenet, if I interpreted you correctly, that comes out of that, that is the most deadly of all, is that economic activity has nothing to do with social cost. Right. Right. That's it. As, as, as Chomsky describes it, externalities. Right. 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 Externalities. That the question of values, the question of morality, the question of justice are all irrelevant. Jobs. It's irrelevant. Right. Right. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think that, you know, the great challenge with people is to convince them how, how deadly that, that ideology is 
and the damage that it does to their own lives. And that basically you have somebody in office, you have, a, you have two political parties in office, one of which is, is on the side of the, a type of extremism we haven't seen in, since, since uh, the, 18, the, the first Gilded Age, in, in which their lives are really in peril. And that it's, a, it's an administration that has lied it benefits the rich. I mean, look, look at the tax proposal that Bush, that, I'm sorry, that uh, Trump has just proposed. Only 35% of the American public buys it. 35%. That's all. I mean, nobody wants it. Everybody knows it's a lie. It has nothing to do with middle class people. It has nothing to do with the poor, except it's going to tax them more. And everything to do with a giveaway to the corporate and the, and the rich elite. You know, that's a contradiction. I mean, that begins to open up doors where it seems to me you can undermine the kinds of promises made by these people, which are nothing more than outright lies. That's all they are. And that's an educational issue. That's an educational intervention, right? I mean, if you can't change people's consciousness, Rob, where do you go with that? You just assume that somehow there are political guarantees that will unfold on the basis of economic structures as they become more severe and produce a greater culture of cruelty? Do we have no theory of subjectivity or agency here? Is that something we should we should banish from politics? You banish that from politics, and you have no politics. Now, you brought up the concept of agency, and uh, I think it's a really interesting term that is not discussed enough, although it comes up more and more in my interviews. Agency, why don't you describe your idea of what agency is? I think agency is are with it. I, I'm sorry? And what the problems with it are. I, I think, there is, well, let me, first it seems to me that when you talk about agency, you're, you're talking about something that's fundamental to what it means for people to have the capacities, to learn the capacities and exercise those capacities, to learn how to govern rather than be governed, to have some control over the institutions that bear down on their lives in ways in which they can both analyze those institutions and they can change them. Well, and I'll go a little, I'll take it even simpler. I think agency is the ability to make a decision and, and execute it in your life and to have the confidence to be able to do that. And what you're saying in your book, and what you're saying here, is that neoliberalism and the kind of authoritarian attack on, on people that we're now experiencing is it's eroding people's sense of agency. I, absolutely. I, I mean, it erodes it in two ways. It erodes it economically in that it places people in a position in which the only thing they can think about is surviving. When time becomes... It, when time becomes, is no longer a luxury, but is a burden, your agency is limited. Agency is limited. To, agency has something to do with questions of choice. And it seems to me the more choices you have, the greater your sense of agency. But when, what people don't realize is you have to, choice is not a universal value. You have to understand choice in terms of constraints. There are people who have constraints on that make those choices almost negligible. They have very few choices. That's when you live in a, in a world in which you're just trying to survive. You have to make a choice between medicine and food. You, you know, you, you have to make a choice between, you know, wearing the same clothes for seven days and, and maybe being able to take your kid out to McDonald's. I don't know. Uh, the second thing is, it seems to me, there are a number of forces that work ideologically that consistently work to depoliticize people. And that infringes on their sense of agency. It says, for instance, the notion when Margaret Thatcher married Ronald Reagan, you know, and they came up with the notion that, uh, you know, they, they produced George Bush. They came up with the notion that, you know, that's all there is, right? There's nothing beyond capitalism. That's all there is. There's no such thing as society. There are only individuals pursuing their own self-interest. I mean, that's a form of depoliticization. When you go to schools that actually kill kids' imagination by teaching for the test endlessly and doing everything you can to make sure that kids don't question authority, or engage critically with the work that they're dealing with, that's a form of depoliticization. That's a narrowing of agency. So the question becomes, what are all the forces ideologically, economically, politically, that work to narrow one's sense of agency? That's the great crisis. When you eliminate historical memory, you know, like, I don't know if you know that, when uh, Bush's brother, uh, Jeb, was the governor of Florida, they put through in the legislature a, a, a law that said that teachers of social studies could not interpret history. All they could do is teach the facts. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's the narrowing of history. You know? That's the narrowing of agency. When the police departments now increasingly all over the United States are saying that we're going to pass laws that make protests 
demonstrations, felonies, felonies. We're going to criminalize that behavior. That's a narrowing of agency. And I, and I think that it's, if, if I'm reading you correctly, and I don't know if you share this with me, one of the great crises of the times is the crisis of agency. It's the crisis of, it's the crisis of individual and collective agency. I would agree. And we're going to take a little station ID here. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com. Listen to it on Pacifica Radio, on Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes, on Stitcher, at opednews.com slash podcast. And like, you've been listening to Henry Giroux, who has a new book out called The Public in Peril. Public in Peril, Trump and the Menace of American Authoritarianism. Now, in your book, you, you, you refer, we've been talking a lot about neoliberalism, and I, I want to stay with that. How does neoliberalism and agency come together? I think that neoliberalism does everything, everything it can to basically dismantle the conditions for what, what I would call <clears throat> empowering forms of agency. It does everything it can to disinvest in public goods that provide people with the supports that they need to not have to live a life in which they're merely trying to survive or live a life in which the imagination is seen as the enemy of, of, of agency itself or live a life in which they truly believe that other people can make decisions for them and that they don't have to make decisions or live a life in which, as the current president says, it's better to be stupid and not to believe in evidence or arguments or rigorous rigorous kinds of dialogue or informed judgments, it's better to do that than to uh, not believe in that stuff than it is to basically, uh, you know, believe in it. I mean, all those things are part of a neoliberal ethic that operates off the assumption that there are very few people who, you know, not Chomsky talks about this all the time, that, you know, he takes it from Adam Smith, that the masters of the world, right, they're the ones who will control everything, that there is a hierarchy of intelligence, a hierarchy of genes, a hierarchy of ethnicity and race. And these are the people who basically are going to make the world a better place. We often put them in Ivy League schools, and we say they're the best and the brightest. And of course, what they really are are people who emerge out of a criminogenic environment in which they learn that uh, activity should be, should be uh, abstracted from social cost, and that the only, really, the only transaction that really matters is making more money and, and accumulating more power. You know, it makes me think of Howard Gardner. Howard Gardner created this concept of multiple intelligences. And, uh, among educators, he's, 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 a, he's a rock star. And the basic idea is that looking at intelligence, it's not just about what IQ measures in terms of medical and verbal skills. Uh, he talks about all kinds of different intelligence. There's social intelligence, there's visual spatial intelligence, there's e ecological intelligence, and what you just described is what neoliberalism embraces is money and, and, and success with money. Yeah. And it, the reality is that many of the people who are successes with money are virtual ignoramuses when it comes to the heart, when it comes to compassion, when it comes to social, uh, the social world. And, and uh, I, humans live in a social environment, a social milieu, and they, then they live within an ecological environment. And if you don't get all of those together, then you're pretty dumb. And if all you focus on is money, then there's something wrong with you. It's not just that you're smart, it's that there's something wrong with you. You have a hole in yourself. You have a hole in your soul, you have a hole in your heart. You're damaged and there's no way that you should be in a leadership role. Maybe you should be in an advisory role with, as long as there's somebody else there who's a grown up who has all the pieces put together but certainly shouldn't be doing it on your own. And I think that's what you just described. That's what new neoliberalism not only embraces, but worships. Yeah, no, no, I, I, think, I think what's interesting about that assumption is that there are parts of what it means to be human that can't be measured in commercial transactions. I'm sorry. Absolutely. You know, that, you know, the, the ability to love, the ability to care, the ability for compassion, the ability 
to address human suffering in a way that suggests that we, wherever the human need this human suffering, we all suffer, you know, and are responsible for it. I mean, I think the thing that I find so just deadly about what you've just described is that what we're dealing with now are people that many psychiatrists and psychotherapists and psychoanalysts are claiming are not just damaged, but they're pathological. I mean, when you feel no empathy for other human beings, when you live in a world in which is so insular that you can't imagine what it's like for people who are living on the edge, when you can't recognize the suffering, you not only can't rec recognize the suffering of others, when you see it, you treat it with disdain. I mean, there is a culture of cruelty that has grown, grown up around that mindset that to me, and I write about the culture of cruelty, you know, that is so unique to the times in which we live that in, in my 74 years, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, to take away, to take away food stamps from children in order to give the rich more you know, tax breaks is beyond belief to me. Uh, and it goes on and on. So that what you have is this, you have this mindset that's pathological, but also enormously destructive in terms of its consequences. I mean, it's not just a psychoanalytic category, right? These are not just people who are by all intents and purposes really nuts, I mean, crazy in terms of the narrowness of their preoccupations and the bottomless pit that they operate in that's value-free and seems to be completely removed from any sense of responsibility. But the cruelty, the violence, and the damage that they cause is just mind-blowing. I mean, just mind-blowing to me. I mean, we're on the verge of destroying the planet. Come on. I mean, how much do you, how stupid do you have to be to not be able to recognize the storms, you know, the, the, the carbon dioxide? I'm not sure that it's stupid or it's angry, because I think that, I think there's a lot of stupidity, but I think that anger that's keeping people stupid. And it's, it's rage that the system is screwing them so badly. And I think that's why we've got all these these old white guys who are the, the are and white older white women. Those are mostly the people who are supporting Trump. I think they are enraged. That's where we're, we're seeing this. I mean, what's sad is that their own sense of powerlessness, their own sense of social atomization, their own sense of alienation gets impotence, impotence, powerlessness, vulnerability gets misdirected so easily by a, cult, a set of cultural apparatuses, whether we're talking about Fox News, i.e. Pravda, American Pravda, you know, I, I mean, that basically has won them over. I mean, they've taken that rage, outrage, some of which is quite legitimate, and they've misdirected it against other people so as to assume, so as to make them blind to the very conditions that make them outraged in the first place. And I think this is a great victory for kind of oppressive forms of education. I mean, but this has been going on for decades. No, but the technology now and the corporate control is far more concentrated than anything we've ever seen before. Remember, you know, when you and I were kids, very difficult to reach people in some ways, right? Now, all, all you do is you can reach them by their cell phones. You, you can bombard them with tons of information. We have sophisticated ways of polling people. We have sophisticated ways of grabbing their attention. There are multiple platforms by which people are being interpolated and educated. Uh, it's a tough world. I mean, you, you really have to know what you're doing. You have to know, you have to, as you say, you have to have multiple forms of literacy to be able to work in this world. I brought, was brought up in a print culture. I, I, you know, you're younger than I am, but my culture was a print. It wasn't a visual culture, except for the movies, you know, but I was stuck into the movie so theater. So what do you do with kids? How do, you, how do you go to education in primary and secondary education? How do you change the educational process to so they do with open eyes? I mean, I, I think you do a lot of things. I mean, I think you give teachers more autonomy. You increase the power of labor unions. You, you talk about, you, you, you redefine the mission of schools. Schools are not training centers, sorry. Schools are places that where you educate people to be informed citizens because democracies can't exist without an informed citizenry. That's what schools should be about. They learn so history. They teach. How would they change what they're actually teaching now? Well, I think that what they do a number of things. I mean, I think that they break down the disciplines in ways that suggest that they're far more integrated than they are now. Uh, I think that they relate what they teach to people's lives in ways that uh, allow people to wake up 
I think they do everything they can to unsettle those experiences so kids can learn about a world outside of the world and the neighborhoods in which they, they now live. I think that we put huge amounts of money into uh, educating teachers as we would doctors or people at the very highest levels of the economy. I think we do everything we can to make sure teachers have resources. I think we do everything we can to make sure that the environments that kids come from are environments that allow them to actually know and have this, the time and the space to learn both in the schools and at home. Uh, it goes on and on, you know? Well, I wanna hear more. I wanna hear more about how you would change the content of education so that Look, let's begin with the most basic. Well, wait, so, so that children would be more able to intelligently digest what's going on. Let's begin with the most basic assumption. Actually, I hate to do it, but we've only got uh, two minutes left. Well, I, well, the most basic assumption is the first thing is you want to make sure kids aren't starving and are in, not in ill health when they come to school, because I'm afraid that affects how they learn. So that has to be addressed. Secondly, you've got to wait, you've got to spare the imagination. You know, you've got to allow, you've got to teach in such a way as to allow kids to enter the world with a great sense of curiosity so that they would be rewarded for that. Certainly, you've got to have teachers who know something. You know, you've got to have teachers who basically are intellectuals, who don't just believe in methodologies as the basis for teaching. And fourthly, you've got to make, you've got to make sure that students are not just consumers, but are cultural producers who operate on platforms in which they learn a variety of literacies. Okay. Been listening to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. Uh, the guest today, this is Henry Giroux. He's the author of The Public in Peril, Trump and the Menace of American Authoritarianism. And he holds the McMaster University Chair for Scholarship in the Public in Interests. Thanks, Henry. Okay, thanks, Rob.